The Brass Web by Matthew Didymus Dedicated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary The Brass Web Chapter 1 Pauline Apocalypse Chorus Woe unto the city and its inhabitants. Woe unto the city and its inhabitants. Woe unto the city and its inhabitants. And, finally, woe unto us. One studying the maps today, after two non-consecutive decades of war, famine, pestilence, have passed through the camp like an angel of death passing through mints, like mice chewing bowstrings, frogs eating all the leather horse straps. And the propaganda rings have rippled away the universal truths far out to sea, they may find the name Pakesley worth more than a passing glance. But it is a beacon, a bastion, a rook that moves in the shape of the cross with the teardrop Paisley pattern from the ancient kingdom of Kashmir, of Akbar the Great, spattered all around the foreground. And Pakesley was where the ancient mice battled the frogs near the puddles, both wearing broken teacups as armor and the daintiest teaspoons as lances, and all the while Mr. Snake watched on, nodding in approval. This battle ended with a 3,000, 300, and some odd years truce, which made Mr. Snake eat dust all the while. But the truce has been shook. The people of this modern day may think the ideals of humanity, i.e. love thy neighbor, are no more than a semblance of ideas, shadows, untenable in the days of yesteryear as they are untenable in today's year, that is, the year of tomorrow, today. And though the idealism of each century turns to idolatry of nostalgia the next, the kernel remains inside the calcified lump like a fossil in sandstone. Just as the notion of nations and the amalgamated lands that lasted through the first ten years' war, and everyone swore blood allegiances to, was defeated in the second ten years' war, which everyone treats it as it happened altogether, but it took nearly 32 years. There was eight years the metric system was imposed worldwide, and no just the old metric system, those eight years were out of a ten-month year. And from those nations, a confederacy of horns now reigns, and all who claim to be humankind scattered within the general populace are denizens of ALOG, Air, Land, Ocean, Government, or were until it became ALOE, Air, Land, Ocean, Empire, and those in charge acted like all the world was nostalgic for war, when they were really nostalgic for something untenable. The spirits of the 20th century, 19th, etc., etc., contingency, thy name is recess, are banished and are now haunting the forest among the country folk who came from all corners, the East, the Mid-East, the Far East, all stopping at Millport in the path of the great confessor St. Mirren to pick wild mushrooms and pickle beets, be laborers, to set up little corner shops, to teach the school children arithmetic and grammar, to be nurses and doctors, streamers through the starlit skies, became the bulwarks of what propped up a decaying corpse called the British Empire reanimating it as a Frankenstein's monster, and, well, their descendants, these gentle reminders, remnants, stir about in hill and valley, farmers, salt of the earth, and the newest empire will nay enlist them in any regiment, especially Noah's cooks, because they put visions into the porridge, and visions in the tea, and visions in the meat though it's really just a blend of spices from East African street food artists. There are also those that likely descend somewheres from the Scandinavian region, thousands of years ago, 
most with hitchhiker's thumbs. Typical, really, isn't it? Before all, the ice melted and the land rose to the skies and the seraphs broke from the mirrors of ice. But that was all in the last book, and there is no need to exhaust here all the details. The Scandinavians always thought this land was either different and no bad, or no indifferent and good from their hameland. A third third, the inhabitants of a great lost island to the east that shipwrecked tried to make the mainland, but finding an island were complacent. And then there are the pure Scots, who have only ever been Scots, well, some Brit and Cumbrian, and that is as close as there is to any native man left, except Ireland still pure ire, no matter who the ire is in, as long as they're for Ireland. The old languages are nearly gone, wiped out by the fellow whites. The culture was commercialized, and then Americanized, alcoholized. Then there was nay anything left after that, I. The clothes are misworn, and the food, well, the food has been gone since 1947, when India went for independence, and Pakesley got its first start of food from Pakistan, and for the better. The late 1990s saw the first waves of gentrification. This was the backwash of the unnameable years, and, well, it doesn't even matter anymore. But it did lose the last arc rights on St. Andrew's Cross Street. I used to pop in when I was arriving via Arnold Street. The state of the Catholic Church has been knocked around for quite some time, but the Irish came to save it and then the Polish, and then the Africans, all of them coming with the Black Madonna, and they finally dug into the good earth deep enough to ne'er be moved. Father Jude of Mary Helper of Christians was instrumental in the hearts of many Africans now living upon the braes. He was remembered for his smile, his hands, and his singing of, O Sacrament Most Holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine after the consummation of the Eucharist. But they are all ungovernable, the wild, godful people, whereas the governable are godless. Know that they don't have many gods, all of them money, and know that the godful people don't ascribe to order. They just refuse to be captured again. They're free. One has to read up the ancient manuscripts known as the Bible, but the ruler of this world, Mr. Snake, is nay God, is furthest from God, but nonetheless is still ruling over anyone who has nay shook him off by looking to the cross or the crescent. Symbolically, Catholicism and Islam for these having Mary, the Black Madonna, Queen of Angels and Crusher of Snakeheads, as the perfect example of the eye to God, the Kierkegaardian leap to go about as a hind on the hills, as a witness, an apostle, but so much more, for she bore the Christ child. And as Jesus said, she was no merely blessed for raising him with her mother's milk, but because she followed God's will. And furthermore, he demonstrated how great a mother she was when he said that she was no merely blessed for being related to him through blood, flesh, and bone, but because she heard his words and did them as the one who came from God, and that he heard her word and did it, for she was the woman, the new Eve, given her title at the wedding at Cana. Now the two, the crescent and the cross, are one through the Christ, one through the angels. And the rulers of this age, and ages past, have confused what these two mountains, Zion and Sinai, truly mean, and how Mr. Snake would attempt to, through obfuscation mostly, predictable, to undo what Mary has done through fiat, but it's already been done. 
Oh, how Moses spoke so well, but was understood so poorly by the men folk. St. Luke has a few words in the whole Queen of the South rising up. The 21st century saw the great wave of migrants after Scotland won its rights to its immigration policy. Most came to be with families that had already been started by some great matriarch who had made the journey as a young girl. These sojourning mothers came from Great Mother Africa and all over, wearing paisley shawls as some grand vision that was nay concocted in Victorian myth, but in ancient magic, the powers of creation endowed by the Father Sky for Mother Earth to be the waterfall, endless creation regenerating through the seasons, the moon, and the turtle's shell. Good paisley shawled mothers know how to cook the traditional cakes on holidays. Ideas such as traditional, love, spiritual, are all taboo in the secular world. Though there is nay a reference to such notions of good and evil by the government slash empire, which Scotland is now a client state. Only what is eliminated and what stands, as in the material world, is what stands, the visible, and the invisible does not stand. The material world is now supposed to contain these words since they are ideas and what the imagination of another eliminated word would bend and shape them to mean in the mind, heart, and belly of man, as it were. And so existing as a concept, but if it can I be material produced, it does nay have a usefulness to the empire. Ideas, the loftiest ones, as it were, were forbidden. The holidays are no meant to be celebrated, but within some hames the days are remembered, and the churches of various religions are free to celebrate, but it'd be unlikely that anyone from church would ever serve the state. Even a lapsed quasi-agnostic with any blood of orthodoxy would nay be allowed for averse to the reasoning of old that atheists and agnostics could nay loyally swear else if they did not pledge fealty to the god the government had sanctioned was all right to worship from a purely unfeeling way. ALOG 288.8. But now that was rewritten under ALOE, and it was reversed so that if you believed in God beyond an unfeeling way, you were thought a candidate for the ladder and water tower which was developed during the reign of George III for the Mad, a sort of landmark to the east of Hawkhead Road. The industrial laundry sat in the woods of Jenny's Reserve, near the Cart River, where many of the remnants of industry sat. The old iron foundry that in years past roared a blaze on Seething Lane via Seed Hill Road, bedazzling the skyline babies, Sat desolate on desolation row by the cart, with many of the desolation angels going from its large smokestack to the spires of St. Miriam's Cathedral. The old Shaw mills had been torn doomed, save a few which were now offices and flat suites to let. At night, spotlights would shine, and the shadows of the architecture of the old buildings seemed to be alive, breathing, sighing. The candle mass had just been, though nobody mentioned it, nay even the angels, who wandered again from the spires doing the road to Harvey's little pub on Glasgow Road. Some indeed patronized both church and pub, but were the ones who would nay talk of it the most. Though within communities of the old folk, it was known who held on to the old ways. Organized religion had been propagated as a great danger during the first and second virus, though all gatherings and organizations were thought dangerous. Only the dead wore religion with any lasting, dignified sense, though simple rain would dissolve their stone markers as well. But these days, no one would dare have had a cross-shaped 
tombstone. No, in the last 15 years, just maybe a little tea imprinted. The large windies of Harvey's fogged up from the heat inside and the damp cold outside. Though the fog could be wiped away to allow for a glimpse to look outside, it would close in again with condensation and veil what passed. Thus the veil was nay lifted, but kept in place. So unbeknownst to the tinkling of beer and cider glasses and the twinkling of scotch and gin shakers, a wee blur named Ronnie Webb walked past in a blurry coat, leaving behind a drag line of glowing brass. And the angels followed him, for his mother had prayed a subak for him. He kept his head doon, doon the blurred road. After a few blocks, he took a sharp right. He always took corners perpendicularly which incidentally was south, doing along the mossy, flowery, damp, grayish-green stone walls. Behind the walls were residences, cookie-cutter hames with little red and white stones dumped in front and leveled out for driveways. The kind of hame you'd expect people to pass by and say, eh, pretty good, aye? There were trees that hung over the stone wall, and from time to time Ronnie would duck and weave like a gallant weaver, conscious of any oncoming or rearcoming pedestrians or cyclists' movements. For, as he was a rook, if he could move up the board, he would be as valuable as, oh say, a rook in a pond. Eventually he came to Hawkhead Station and went over the false hill. The train tracks ran under the false hill, and Ronnie liked to time out so he could either see a train coming or going. His dad had told him they went over a bridge that was also built during the reign of George III. Atop the false hill, he scanned Dune at the platform where the train cars landed, and he looked up to the glorious green braes that surrounded Pixley. The furthest one had a waterfall parents had taken him to, and the closest was the cemetery, and far beyond the cemetery, was the ladder and water tower. His grandmother's hoose was just across the road from the cemetery, but he was going just past it to a corner shop before coming straight back home to his mother's. When he came dune off the hill, he crossed over to the side where the cemetery wall split into a tall black steel fence, presumably so people could look in to see the graves as they passed, and no so the graves could look out. And as one passed, one could see inside. Hawkhead Hill, the cemetery hill, though some called the fake hill, Hawkhead Hill, a faux pas for sure, a mass to the east, low and long, long and luxurious green, luxurious green and fiat lux, though clear throat, fully encompassed by the, quote, this perforated wall, Many of the gravestones were from the First and Second World's War. They made a new cemetery for World War III, but we call it the First Ten Years' War. Well, actually, we don't. <laughs> the boy looked within the damp, mossy gravestones scattered uphill, and throughout there were the damp trees whose branches often were so heavy that they'd split and fall upon the stones. There was, um, the gorse. The cemetery was so large that it had to be maintained by the council, but the lowest parts were continually flooded, and between the floods and moss, ivy, lovebine, woodstone, and gravity, the whole graveyard was becoming a grave unto itself. Close to the fence, Ronnie saw a large stone cross that had been broken off at the base and was laying in two further sections on the ground, half in the water, under a tree branch. He remembered a metal cross being in his grandmother's hoose beside his great-grandmother as she lay a-dying on the pull-out couch. It had the same sort of weaving design inlaid. The name at the base could nay be read. He sometimes thought that this was his granny's, since he 
Didn't they remember where it was? Her funeral was blacked out in his memory. But he reverenced this broken stone like it was hers. He felt sad it was broke. He felt sad all the day because of a dream he had had about his great-grandmother. His great-grandmother had died in her nightgown when he was very young, and he didn't even remember seeing the cross for some time until he started passing the cemetery. Driven forth from this pensive moment of recollection, Ronnie kept doing the road. A pool of brass remained where he had stopped. He had two pound in his pocket, but he was mostly sent out for fresh air. He had stayed home sick from school, but was sent by his mother with a shopping list of two jacket potatoes, eggs, bread, cooking oil, some other scribbles. Ronnie had made the trip before with his mother, and the shop owner was well known to the family, being the uncle of Ronnie's uncle's longtime girlfriend, and for his shop, serving to all in the community. Uh, the individual and basically the whole community, state, and everything had ceased by way of collection, operation, initiative, network, which every PM promised for the denizens that they work hard to achieve each year. But it's just a carrot to increase the GDP, which artificially inflates the value of the coin. So the geniuses who run finance believe that if we work everyone to death, they'll make some to a lot of money. And if they make everyone miserable by collecting and withholding basic goods, then they'll be able to hoard those goods, which I guess is Machiavellian, but it's just cartoonishly stupid. And they're serious about it. Serious to the point that they think it's a mystery. Like an Elysian mystery of taking a little bit of moldy wheat with wine and having a so-called religious experience because of food poisoning? But even the Mediterranean people thought to only have the experience, no have endless fun doing it. That just led to mischief. And it's just asinine. But it's like some sort of religion to them. A mischievous, asinine religion of money. The counter-argument, which is nay allowed, except as a mischaracterized concept to explain the affirmation of the coin, which became the empire's currency, audible sigh, which sort of had its progenesis as a mechanism to do away with empires, is what the common good was now controlled by radical individualism. And so any good was temporal, but stained. And that stain would remain. Which was somehow thought to be a weapon of those who were in power, and would never gain power by their radical individualism. So as many arguments are but sands, as so as one tries to sort them out, they shift and sift into the winds, losing all. Ronnie had a faint idea that the man who ran the shop was his relative in some way. There is no ownership. There is no property. But as it is, the people were allowed to keep things tidy for the ALOE and run the various shops and businesses still necessary. The shop was on the corner and had a large sign that said Ptolemy's Store. The bell rang upon Ronnie's entering, uh, entrance. A man with a little yellow mustache and a big yellow coat came out from the back of the yellow building. Well, yellow and some brown. The fluorescent lights showed all the places water had leaked through the ceiling, doing the walls in the past 50 years. Mr. Ptolemy welcomed Ronnie with a grand, Hello, Governor. Ronnie was familiar with the shopkeeper's mannerisms, but they made him feel awkward as he couldn't any relate to any adult, and certainly was usually never addressed as governor, or even by his name, except for attendance, which he didn't any hear today. Hello, I have things to pick up for mum. Ronnie tried to hand the money over with the list, but the shopkeeper had already turned his back. Then Ronnie tried to wiggle for him to spend a pence 
or 2p on something personal there. But he was eyeing the cheapest candy as an anticipation, nonetheless. All the more, even. Oh, I, she rang, and I have the things for you. Mr. Ptolemy shuffled the grocer's shuffle behind the counter with a few things he had taken the liberty to gather for the lad. The boy stood afar. Well, come here, to the register. Have ye the money? The many what? Mr. Ptolemy laughed a hearty laugh. No, boy, the money. Have you the money? What's it cost? The boy said, walking forward, looking at the candy. Let's see as I ring it up. Two packs of jacket potatoes, four pounds, eggs, 119, oil, 190. Mother gave me a two pounder. Oh, she must only need a half dozen eggs and just two jacket potatoes? Ronnie looked blankly. Uh, it just there, laddie, the half dozen. The small one? Half of one, six of the other? I, <laughs> I. The lad turned where the shopkeeper had pointed and walked and grabbed the small one. Aye, aye, all right. So these at 40p and 40p and 22 and 90 and bread. Hmm. I'm sorry, but it's still short. You need 10p, Ronnie. The lad had nothing to say. He just stared and wanted the ordeal over, and the man sensed this. Uh, all right, Ronnie, uh, I don't even know. He looked with a salesman's fluster and rubbed his hands together like someone trying to keep warm, and then a spark flashed across his eyes. Would you do something for me? Could, could you deliver something for me on your way home? Ronnie couldn't find any ground to tread in this whole experience. Adults didn't ask him to do things. He was told what to do, and he did it. Okay, he mumbled after the silence pressed him. Wonderful. So, do you know Mrs. Rainrag on your street? She's the one that walks outside on Sundays in her nightgown. Ronnie's eyes went wide. But he still had no answer. Uh, just a minute. Um, you know what your address is. To Glasgow Road. Hi, and Miss Rainrag lives on Glasgow. So uh, at the corner, uh, when you would turn, that is the thousand block. And it goes doing a hundred every block. It's easy. The, the streets are numbers, I. You know the streets. Uh. I heard of Fifth Street Auto. <laughs> Clever lad, I. So on Fifth Street, that would be the 500 block. And Miss Rainrag lives just beyond that on the 400 block. 404, apartment 2 slash 2. If you can take this box to her, she always pays every two weeks for, well, anyway, this box of food is nay too large, and you only need to ring her buzzer and Tell her you're there with her groceries from Mr. Ptolemy, and she'll let you in. She can't they walk much, but she'll let you in, and then you can go on to your house. I, while Mr. Ptolemy was delighted, the lad remained daft to it all. He understood he was doing something, but a fog had set upon his mind, dampening the cortex, the burning bush that doesn't exhaust, Though it may calcify. Here you are. Uh, the bag is yours for your mum. And then the box is for Mrs. Rainrag, I. I. And here, I'll write her name and address. And when you get to the building, you can find her name, I. I. The lad was more sure, uh, sure of himself now that he was being told what to do directly. Though, if his ma had phrased it, she would say, I wrote her name and address, and you will have to find her name, and so on and so forth. That he could understand. 
Like, all right, Ronnie, eh, that's more than a 10 p job. Would you like a chocolate? You, you must eat it here before you get home. Oh, no. Don't I want you hiding anything from your mom? I'll eat it here. Mr. Ptolemy laughed. I hear a lad. You can eat a chocolate bar faster than light hits the back wall. Well, go on. Which one would you like? The shopkeeper gestured to the side, and the boy looked at what was generally no within financial reach, Sam's windfall. He saw the rows of different chocolates and candies. He reached out slowly but looked to Mr. Ptolemy for reassurance, and the man's smile made him look back and quickly grab a red package bar, his favorite. I go on, it's yours. Ronnie opened the wrapper and started to take little front teeth bites until it was all gone, and his soul felt lifted. His eyes were bright with the excitement of a mouthful of honeycomb chocolate, like Jonathan in the battle against the Philistines. All right, all right, so here you are, Ronnie. You do as you're told, I. The boy shook his head in the affirmative and reached up for the box. As he was leaving, Mr. Ptolemy said, Ta! Ronnie turned at the door and said, Cheers! Ronnie left and continued up the road past the cemetery and crossed to be on the other side as he neared the false hill. He was so excited he forgot to look over at his grandparents' goose as he passed. Just then the wind had picked up and it was a bit hard to carry the box. But the clouds were nay bursting with rain just yet. Ronnie made it to the turn, and he looked to see the numbers on the sides, on all sides, but now on the sides of the hooses that he was on, and he was astonished to see them descending from 920 to 902 to 820 to 802. He looked at every number on every hoose and was somewhat amazed the trend continued. He passed Harvey's and passed 5th Street, and he saw the numbers were in the 400s. Towards the end, he found the number he was given, 404. He looked at the building and saw the entranceway that was much like the entranceway of the building he lived in. He walked very carefully to the door and saw the buzzer box and found Mrs. Rainrag at number 2 slash 2 just like Mr. Ptolemy had said. He rang the buzzer, and as he pressed it, it buzzed as his finger pressed the button. Soon a voice came to the buzzer. Hello, asked the shaking voice. Ronnie froze, but he managed to speak out. I have your things? From Loomis? Who is this? Ronnie Webb? Oh, Loomy has another web. Come in. Ronnie stood aback as the buzzer sounded. Then he walked forward a buzz with adrenaline and pushed the door open. He entered the first door and there was a stairway immediately to his right and a hall staring back at him. Ever so slowly, slowly, not quickly, but in a panic he couldn't even remember her number as he walked down the hall. So he looked to find it dune along the patterns of the carpet. And he fumbled through his pocket all the while maintaining the box of food from spilling the groceries. He finally set his back to the wall midway down, either out of desperation under the weight he had carried, or to retrieve the information from either his person, i.e. his pockets, or his mind. Then a voice came from the stairwell. Come to number two slash two then, Sonny. Ronnie backed up from the wall and the voice called again. And as he started walking down towards the stairwell, he heard the voice call a third time. So he answered, I, I'm here. I, two slash two, you dap ween. He went upstairs and an old woman was sitting on a chair in the hall in front of her door. She stood in her nightgown, and Ronnie thought of his grandmother in his dreams. 
She basically just wore her nightgown towards the end of her life. So, he thought of nightgowns, and death, and dreams, and death. He nearly paused, but continued forward, arms out around the box. His brain felt like it was on a chain, pulling him forward, like when his mother was working with the garden tiller. His head was shaken just as much as hers did. And what's all this besides, she said. Oh, it's mine, Ronnie said. Then he corrected. Me mum's? Ah, well, hey, you that mine as well? Bring it to the table, will ye? Ronnie went inside, barely scraping by her nightgown, and rushed to the table. He grabbed his mom's grocery bag and stared at the door, and then at Mrs. Rain Rag as she looked back at him. So you're the professor's son. Hi. You stand as wobbly neat as he used to, she said, digging a room. I know your grandma, you know, been in Pakesley since we were your age. Uh, we go there Sundays. I, like I don't ain't know you. And don't I go around telling people everything about yourself. Your da had the sense to make up names the first few times he met people. And people don't I need to know who your folks are either. Just say your da is waiting in the car downstairs. Ronnie didn't I know that. But he thought it was strange now to be having a change of words, an exchange of words, like a sea of change, a sea of sea changes of words, a cue chorus of hot boys and frogs and mice. Ronnie started walking back slowly, thinking he could just scrape by again and maybe go completely untouched if he flattened himself against her wall, the way mice flatten themselves to go under doors. He checked the door. Nah, he never fit. N near her, his shoulder blades were skimming the wall as his reverent eyes went up from hers, doomed to her floor. The way he held his body like a statue, it seemed like he was falling over every time he dropped or drooped his oversized head. He didn't dare look towards her apartment the whole time, but now he saw it out of the side of his eyes. Mrs. Rainrag maintained her stare, and just before Ronnie looked to the door again, Miss Rainrag moved and said, I hold you there a minute. Ronnie wanted to go forward and leave. She said she had seen me? She knew me? Ronnie was trying to remember if he remembered seeing her before. Maybe he remembered her from his dreams. The door was closed and he wanted to go underneath it. But as he was thinking that, Miss Ringrag shuffled away and shuffled back. Ronnie looked into her apartment now. It had two red cloth chairs and a television set. He looked back at Miss Rainrag and she came back with something in her hand. Here, laddie. Two P for nay having to see old Boomy today. And don't a tell him I give it ye, or else he'll start coming back. Thanks, great grana, Ronnie said. His eyes got large and he stared at the woman. Ha, <laughs> your great grand Hannah, she was a fine woman. I suppose she had a nightgown as this. Ronnie nodded and said, I. Heading back out the door, he felt he could walk under it now, but Mrs. Rainrag had opened it. She watched the boy up until he was just out of the threshold, and then she shut the door behind him. Ronnie took in deep breaths in the clothes, then he walked home, pure mortified. He put the 2P in his hand, the two 1P coins. He clacked them together a few times and then pocketed them. He was nearly crying, but it had been a while since he'd cried last. 
So it was Nan out of nowhere. It had certainly been a crying day. When he got home, he put the bag of groceries dune on the kitchen table and ran up to his room. His mother, Andromache, the man battler, followed him and he was on his bed crying. She was afraid and asked him what was wrong, but all he could say was that he didn't know. She rubbed his back until he wore himself out, and then she left him alone to take a nap. Oh, my face be a moon, and clouded too, Andromache said, quoting again, or rather her version where she remained in the character of the last book she was reading, and just kept speaking, adding lines to the part. She worried about her son Ronnie, but she had worried about him for a day and a half, and was finally giving herself the night off. She had just wanted him to get out for some fresh air that day. That was supposed to be for her time off. But then he came home crying and out of breath. <laughs> she needed to get him ready for, or maybe just keep a lack the day, the weekend approacheth. There was a birthday party, unofficially tomorrow, Friday, the actual day, but officially it was Sunday. And if she was nay taking Ronnie, she probably wouldn't nay go, although she wanted to. She always liked going to her in-laws on Sundays. All through the separation, she did nay miss a Sunday, mostly because Hector was nay likely to show up until very late, and did nay. But she had missed a few Sundays here and there, ceaselessly contingent. But to call them to mind was like keeping a pressed weed in a book just to pull off the shelf when you're unable to sleep and prick yourself with every few months. But to each their own neurosis, say la vie. She resolved to call his father's office the next day. The case of spontaneous combustion, Hector said, we have read about, some felt gave credit to an unwarranted fear. He was interrupted by a page of a squire of a night, telling him he had a phone call. Hello, he ventured. It's Aunt Ronnie stayed home from school yesterday. Then I sent him out for some fresh air, but he came home crying. What? Today? N no, yesterday. He went to school today. Aye, right. I asked him why, but he said nothing was wrong, and later he said a great thing had happened. Yesterday, I, well, I, I, uh, but I am worried. It's nay just a story. I, sorry, uh, did you leave the hoose today? I, I just told you he went to school. Uh, I, I, I know, just saying. Uh, he was fine today. He said Cress's uncle gave him a job delivering groceries, and he got a chocolate bar. And Mr. Lumi gave us two and a half pounds of potatoes when I asked for two individual potatoes and a lot else besides. I, I told Ronnie not to get everything on the list. I just wanted him to pick up a few things is all. <laughs> that old stargazer. He always gave Ma food on discount too, but never gave me anything for delivering groceries. He tried to pinch me tips too. He did. He did. They both paused. They usually did not dip into their old banter. The game was to continue saying just he did in different forms. It was there, but both just welcomed its presence and did not continue. Oh, when did you and Troy start? I started with Uriah, uh, then Troy started. That's how he started meeting with Crescent. I think I was seven or eight. How old is Ren? Hey, yeah, he's about the same age I was when I started. Andromache burst but stopped. She was trying her best nay to laugh at Hector, almost flat out asking her how old their son was. 
Ronnie made 2P. He can start saving for university. He's about the same age you were when you started saving for university. I? Well, I... I. Hector appreciated the moment, holding his words in the side of his mouth like a savory piece of haggis. I... He's about due for a savings account, maybe. I, I don't even know how he feels about going out tonight. He was laughing and crying in one afternoon, on top of being sick. I, I, I guess there's no need to. What are you going out for? Cress's birthday is tonight. I, I know. We always have it on Sunday, don't I, we? We still have something on her birthday. Still? D doesn't they try to take her out? I, Hector. She never wants a party. Then Troilus asks her to marry him, and she says no. And then they walk around Toon for a while and come late to the party and apologize, and we say it does not matter. We'll have something on Sunday, and your parents go to sleep first. Still? I, oh, we did not stop with. When two very familiar people have heard certain phrases, certain pieces of music, they immediately recognize it, and they instantly recognize what the completion of the piece is. Uh, how is Cress? I think she's cooling off. I, okay. Hector was swimming in milky gossip, unknowingly turning it, churning it into a cheese he would have to eat his way free of. Well, cheers for calling. You're welcome. Uh, are you late getting back? N no, that's okay. The kids will just leave. I mean, I should see if they stole my briefcase. That's your only class, I. Andromache, Ronnie is first. Always. Okay, I'll keep him tonight. Aye. Aye. Bye, Hector. Bye, Andromache. Hector, the great restrainer, restrained himself from his hot tears and walked back to his class with a heart full of mysterious promise.